Great to see so many returning names and faces of attendees joining us this week. We've got an outstanding guest, one who we've had several times before, and it's always one of folks' favorites, Rob Cross. We'll be getting to him in just a little bit. Uh, but until then, if you're new to this call series, uh, the, we are the Institute for Corporate Productivity, I4CP. We're a human capital research firm. We discover the people practices that drive high performance. We define that with four fairly standard business metrics, revenue growth, market share, profitability, and customer satisfaction. We do our work through major studies. We do four to six major studies every year. We do a series of pulse surveys, other, other research. We're also a peer-based community uh, of HR leaders. You see here just a small sampling of some of the member organizations that make up the I4CP community. They range from very large organizations like Microsoft, 3M, Amazon, Visa, and many others. Um, they span across all different industry verticals, uh, from banking to high tech to manufacturing, retail, uh, healthcare. We've got a lot of regional health healthcare hospital systems, regional banks, uh, and others in membership. If you're with a member company, uh, whether your logo is shown here or not, welcome. Great to have you with us today. Uh, if you're with a different organization who's not yet a member but would like to learn more about what that entails, just reach out to anyone at I4CP. You can find us on, on LinkedIn. You can find us at our website or just go to I4CP.com. Um, we'll be happy to, to reach out and get in touch with you and give you that information. My name's Tom Stone. I'm a senior research analyst on the research team here at I4CP. Um, I'll be introducing our special guest and leading the conversation with him in just a little bit. But before then, I have a few other quick announcements. Um, one, uh, please keep the chat open. Uh, continue to introduce yourself if you're just rolling in, maybe rolling off some previous meetings. I saw folks joining us today from all four corners of the U.S. I saw Canada, Switzerland, South Africa represented, so truly a great global audience today. We are Next Practices Weekly, so we'll be having more sessions coming up on October 24th, the 31st, November 7th. You see some of the great organizations represented there. We'll have guests from Axis Capital, T. Rowe Price, and Oshkosh. We also do get together occasionally in person, especially for our big conference each year, which is in March at the uh, Scottsdale Fairmont Princess uh, Resort. Uh, you see here this year, it'll be very early in March, uh, March 3rd through the 26th, 2025. So just a few months away, if you're making your first quarter travel plans, please keep us in mind. And in particular, uh, notice in the bottom left there, there's a QR code. If you register by November 15th, you can save $300 uh, on, on the registration cost for the conference. We're excited to announce a sort of second raft of uh, speakers here uh, for the conference. So many of the names and faces you see on the screen today are just being announced for the first time today. We've got a nice mix of academic leaders and thought leaders. We've got high-level HR leaders from companies as diverse as Dow, Atlassian, ServiceNow, Microsoft, Laird Norton, Amazon, Mondelez International. If you're not familiar with Mondelez, they of course make our favorite Oreo cookies. Um, so great lineup of, of speakers. Um, this is just a small fraction of them. A uh, couple of things that are different about our event. Uh, one, uh, we only have general sessions, so you don't miss anything. You all, Every speaker is this sort of high level, high quality HR leader and thought leader in the industry. And also there's no vendors, there's no expo hall, no distractions at our conference. It's just five to 600 HR professionals like yourself getting together to learn about the future of work. All right, um, we're going to be talking about culture today. Uh, and before I, I bring on Rob, I wanted to just give a, a couple moments overview of, of a little bit of our research. Many of you are members and, and have seen some of our re research on culture before. Some of you might be newer to I4CP and, and less familiar. So I've just got three quick slides. First, this is what we call our people productivity chain. Uh, this has evolved over the years, but for many years, over a decade now, we've been focused on five core areas that drive business growth, market, strategy, culture, leadership, and talent. And so I, I'm just sharing this in particular for those of you maybe a little bit newer to I4CP so that you understand that culture is something that we take very seriously. We've done many uh, robust studies on culture over the years, and we, we've elevated it uh, in terms of our research agenda uh, to the same level that we do talent practices, leadership, uh, the, the organization strategy and their place in the market. What we have found in our research is that these five elements together are what collectively drive productivity in organizations. And since we're so focused on productivity and looking at HR practices from a business lens, we like to dive into all five of these over time. 
Uh, one of our more recent studies on culture, uh, we, we, uh, this is just sort of a, a high level model, lacks any of the, the correlation numbers, but uh, what we found was that leaders modeling organizational values helps to drive greater trust and it also helps to drive culture health. Uh, trust in turn also drives culture health indirectly. That in turn drives productivity and ultimately market performance. So this just kind of gives you a glimpse of some of the out outputs that we have from some of our major studies where we can find these correlation metrics between, between different aspects of an organization and how they ultimately drive higher market performance. And then also uh, drilling into a little bit of the data, I mentioned earlier, we, we're really focused at I4CP on what high performance organizations do differently. Uh, so in one of our uh, several culture studies, we looked at various aspects or traits of cultures, found some to be traits of healthy cultures, others to be traits of what we call toxic cultures. Here, except for the one in the bottom right, are, are several that we found that were traits of healthy cultures. Some of these won't be, of course, surprising to you, but what might be surprising is the significant delta between the high performance organizations you see in blue that indicated their culture has these traits and the low performance cultures in the light gray. Some of these deltas, some of these differences, 3x difference, uh, you see that for highly collaborative organizations there in the bottom left where 63% of high-performing organizations are highly collaborative versus only 23% of low performers. Or also values transparency, a 2x difference there. I highlight those two in part because those are a couple of the elements that Rob has done a lot of work on, and we're gonna bring him on uh, here in just a moment. But just to give you an example of, of, of something that isn't a trait of a healthy culture, being top down, being command and control as an organization, you see there the flip is true, that more low performance organizations have that trait uh, than high performers. All right, so that gives you a, a peek, particularly for those of you that are new to I4CP, maybe new to our culture research in particular. That's the kind of work we do here and provide snippets of it to the, to the greater public, but deep dive reports and tools and, and implementation advice and so on to, to our, our member community. With that, I'm going to bring on uh, Rob Cross, Edward A. Madden Professor of Global Leadership at Babson College. Uh, and SVP of research here at I4CP. Uh, and Rob's going to walk us through some of his research related to culture. Welcome, Rob. All right. Thank you so much. I, I'm happy to be here and really grateful for uh, everybody's time to kind of engage and, and spend some time reflecting on culture, both historically and also kind of as we move further and further into these hybrid ways of working, how it's uh, you know transmitted, developed, nurtured, changed. So I appreciate the chance to be here with everybody. Great, great to have you, Rob. And just a reminder for folks, we're going to um, be using the chat today as we always do. So if you have questions for Rob as he gets going, he always covers a wealth of information. Um, so please just ask those questions in the chat and I'll keep an eye on that. So Rob, before we we, we dive in too far on uh, the content you've got for us today, just tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and your career and sort of what got you into uh, the things you'll be discussing today. Yeah, yeah. So I've been, uh, as some of people on the call know, I, I see some familiar faces with Hemerson and others uh, here that have, have kind of heard me prattle on about who I am about five times, 10 times. So I'll ask you to uh, bear with me through that. But for people that are new to what uh, we focused on here, um, I've been very uh, kind of geared in on using a technique called organizational network analysis. And so a way of mapping who's interacting with whom in groups inside organizations to see how collaboration is happening. And we may be using this as a device to look at a, a couple thousand people in an organization, or in the case of culture, you know, sometimes those groups were 50, 60, 90,000 people, where we were really taking this idea that culture ultimately is not quite as uniform as we think it is. Uh, in many cases. So a lot of times we go into organizations and you do these culture surveys and you get a score of, let's say, four, let's say on this, this idea of values transparency, right? We as an organization, Tom, to your point, we say we value transparency uh, in our engagement survey, our culture survey, whatever it may be. And you think, oh my gosh, we're great. We got a score of four out of five, right? It's okay. It's not great, but it's okay. It turns out when you distribute those scores on these network analytics, you actually get a very different perspective. You tend to see these pockets of threes and fives, or you actually see that very central people can be twos and fives. <laughs> so the most negative and the most positive people oftentimes take the, the center position uh, in these networks. And so for me, uh, in relationship to the specific body of work, you know, I've been mapping these network analytics for 26 years. We've worked with over 400 organizations. 
but there was a really significant stretch with the member companies that we were really engaged in. How do you think about culture a little bit differently, right? Are there nuances you can see and take action on with this network lens? It's a little bit different than our more conventional ways of, of assessing and, and measuring culture. And that's what I'd like to kind of hone in on and, and share specifically today. Yeah, so we'll get to that uh, sort of connection uh, in just a moment with culture. But if I know you've got one slide to start us off. For those that are new to organizational network analysis, some of you maybe have seen this before, but I think you have two diagrams that help explain what ONA is and, and, and walk us through sort of a, an example. Yeah, yeah, and I always do like to level set. And so uh, for the people that have been around a while, I'll just ask you to, to bear with me a moment here, but uh, to bring uh, new people up to speed, the uh, way of, of, for us, when, when we say network analysis, for people that are familiar with these ideas, it is not thinking of a network as a, a social network, right, or a community where you're just trying to spur more connectivity. It's really trying to be intentional about assessing and mapping who's interacting with whom and using those analytics to guide decisions. Now, this is a, a very um, simplified example. It was from a real group of about 7,000 people, really significant presenting issue uh, that this organization was losing a lot of money because they weren't moving best practice as well across drilling platforms. But um, at a high level, if we, we kind of back away and say, I don't want to show 7,000 people in a big, you know, messy diagram and all the analytics behind it. Um, at a high level, what we start to see when we compare, for example, the hierarchy with the informal network, right, the pattern of who's interacting with whom, you start to get very different insights, you know, and for those of you that are, are new to these ideas, your eye is almost immediately going to be attuned uh, to the Mitchells of the world, right? And we can generally expect that three to 5% of the people in most organizations account for 20 to 35% of the value added collaborations, right? So let me say that again, three to 5% of the people, 20 to 30 35% of the value added collaborations. And so they represent a really important set of individuals to be paying attention to that a lot of times from a human capital standpoint, we aren't managing or thinking about them any differently than the people that are that are not absorbing, right, or, or helping support their colleagues in, in this way. So we very much care about them if they're getting overwhelmed, you know, with too many demands. There's a common tendency to put people on teams right and left today. And a lot of times we pick the people that are executing, right, and just keep overwhelming them. And we care about that. We care about them from a culture standpoint, because we know if we can get these influencers engaged in a culture change process, uh, as we'll talk about in a minute, the uptake is much more significant, right, uh, over time. Uh, and yet they're often very hidden. You know, we, we did a very significant study recently for a high tech company and they came to us and they said, gosh, we have our change champions nailed down, right? We know exactly who they are. And it was a very well-known organization. I'm not going to mention the name of, but they had pulled together a group of 175 change champions that they were trying to get to be part of this change process. Turned out that when we compared our uh, analytics showing who the Mitchells were in that organization against their list, they were 72% off, right? They, they actually hadn't picked the people that were most influential, right? The, the leaders' wow. favorites, other things like that had come into the fray. These are all great people, right? They're all good people, but they weren't necessarily the, the influencers, right, that they thought. So at one level, the approach and, and different variants of doing this can help you isolate out um, you know, where are these well-connected people that you want to be thinking about, whether it's from a talent standpoint, a change standpoint. Uh, second, we're very focused on um, not just the center of the networks, but the fringe. And if, for example, we're trying to execute a change or, or you know, uptake a merger or things like that, you're really interested in where those um, individuals, the capabilities, the talent that's not getting fully utilized, right? And, and that can be for, for different purposes, right? And finding ways to kind of pull them into the fray. Um, generally, if it's newcomers, for example, we tend to see that takes three to four years for them to come in and replicate the connectivity of a high performer. But we've learned a lot about people that do that same thing, not in three to four years, but in nine to 12 months, right? And so we've learned a lot about how to create greater agility, right? Whether that's newcomers or people moving across projects uh, in these networks. And then of course, we're always gearing on silos. You know, most efforts to drive one firm cultures or things like that, they are frequently overwhelming employees because they're, they're forcing excessive connectivity. Uh, on to people in different ways. They're delayering, they're putting too much technology at people, and it's drowning them in collaborative demands. One of the strengths of the network approach is it allows you to go and say, you know what, we don't care 
if everybody's connected to everybody else, right? We're nobody on this call wants another email meeting or phone call, right, in their lives. But what we do care about is there are certain junctures in these networks where we're losing scale efficiencies or we're losing innovation potential, or maybe cultural values, right, that are clashing, right, in certain ways that we can start to see a little bit differently. And, uh, and take targeted effort. So uh, that's a, a quick you know, pass through for people that are, are new to the ideas. And I would urge you, if you have questions, you know, thoughts on it, to put it into chat for Tom. If yeah. you're interested in how do you get this information, other things like that, please, yeah. uh, please post it to Tom. Well, as is always the case, even with an introductory sort of review slide for some folks, there's a lot of really key insights that have come from your years of research on this. I, I want to remind folks that because um, it's always in demand when you're when you're a guest with us, um, the slide deck will be available uh, after after the call. We we archive recordings of, of all next practice weekly sessions. So not only could you if you miss some of the call need to leave early or, or came in late, um, the re full recording will be available, but also the, the slides for download. So uh, Great, great stuff already, Rob. Um, so let's let's now pivot and connect it back to culture. Well, how how mm. how are ways that you've you've seen organizations use ONA to drive culture change? Yeah, so uh, it can happen in a bunch of different ways. But one of my favorite is when we're running the analytics and then using the insights from the analytics to design the uh, design and implementation teams, right? Or for example, these change agents, right? That people are trying to pull in early. Um, to, to programs to really be able to see, um, are we getting um, the effective people? And, and again, that to me doesn't mean that the other people aren't effective. It just means that they usually aren't as influential as uh, as you think. So it's just one example. I recently was engaged in, in delivering uh, ideas to the top 100 at one of the major professional services company, right? And they held this offsite in Vienna and their big focus was on, we need to get more ethical leadership, right? That was the value they were trying to, to diffuse. And and it was interesting to me because, you know, in the room, they were saying, gosh, if we can just get this group of people to tell their directs, right, and get them engaged in it, we're going to diffuse this idea. And, you know, that's not really the case, right? I mean, you know that that group of 100 may get to another five people each, and maybe that's 500 out of a 100,000 person <laughs> organization, right? And, and so the group of top leaders, they feel like they're doing big things, but it doesn't really propagate down, right? And, and they know that when you when you kind of bring it up to them. And so I asked them the question, I was like, well, what if we, you know, instead of holding this thing in the, the you know, a swanky hotel in a European city, what if we held it at the Holiday Inn and we invited the hundred influencers right, in the organization, right? And, and actually kind of brought them in and kind of, you know, decided like, what does the future look like, right? What are the things that we stand for uh, a little bit differently? And so I've done that, not so much with this professional services firm, but with a bunch of smaller kind of mid-tier organizations that are saying, how do we be more progressive uh, about driving culture change? And you get a dramatically different uptake. And I'll show you some analytics on this uh, as we go. But I would say if you're looking at these ideas and you're thinking about culture, one is you see very different levers of influence than we conventionally are used to thinking about with just cascading approaches. Number two, you see culture fundamentally differently, right? It's very rarely as uniform as we think. It's these pockets that you start to pick out and it gives you different ways of, uh, of, of, of kind of pulling on the positives and saying, how do we make more of what these teams, these units are doing? And then how do we help remove obstacles from the negatives? Um, very different insights, very targeted insights mm -hmm. than a, a conventional effort to kind of cascade, you know, large scale uh, culture change programs. Yeah, cascading from the top down. Uh, so we've got a question here from Valerie in the chat, um, and I, I think it, it nicely segues to what you were going to talk about next. We wanted to double click into this notion of opinion leaders, of influencers. Mm -hmm. She asked, how can we accurately identify the three to five percent who are so influential? W what are some key things that we should be looking for? Yeah, so it's a great question. So at one level, um, if you use this approach of organizational network analysis, there are a handful of different ways of doing it. You know, and we, we have people on the call that have, have used what I'll call passive analytics, where we are uh, mining kind of passive or digital exhaust data, like emails or calendaring data, things like that. You don't open the emails. You're not kind of into people's business that way, but you're just seeing who's interacting with whom. And you can back away and create these network analytics. And that can help you see uh, who are the, the people that tend to be you know, most heavily sought out in, in different ways. Uh, or you might use a survey-based approach, what most people would call active you know, uh, in analytics. And that can take, you know, generally speaking, about a 10 to 15 minute web-based survey that you're deploying to a population, again, that could be you know, as large as 50, 60, 90,000. 
um, and using that as a, a device to assess, you know, who's collaborating with whom to, to get things done, right? And it allows you to back away and, and generate um, these, uh, these analytics. Um, that's, that's one way to do it, right? And that's, again, when I say that we were showing this other organization that they had dramatically missed on who they thought their change agents were, that's what we were doing. We, we kind of ran the analytics to see, you know, what, what and, and who was going to have the greatest impact for them. Uh, there's all sorts of other subtle devices too, you know, so I was with another group, you know, last week, last Monday, that were change agents, same thing, they'd been selected, we didn't have the ONAs there, and I talked about this, and I said, well, you guys may actually not be the right 20, <laughs> right, in terms of the analytics, you're great people, but you may not be the right one, and they all went, it all in their heads, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, we're, we're charged with driving this big change effort, um, how do we think about this? And so one thing we know, there's this great uh, study in, in social science called, why do my friends always have more friends than I do? <laughs> And it, it's basically a, a look into kind of cascading and networks. And it turns out that um, if you have to coordinate with an area, so let's say that some kind of change process you're trying to implement uh, is affecting, let's just call it marketing, right? Or, or you know, a, a geography, whatever. What you want to do is set up a meeting with somebody in that area to say, how do we get you to engage with us, right? In, in whatever we're doing, whatever we're implementing, you're going to be guessing blindly. Right. You may, you know, pick Mara's, for example, right, because they're on the formal structure and you find out, you know, you don't know it, but they're not as influential as you think. What you do, though, is as you're leaving that meeting, you say, who else cares about this? Right. Who else is for this? Who else is against this? Uh, and, and it's almost like 92 percent of the time, the person they recommend you to turns out to be the Mitchell of the world. Right. And so what I find about really successful change agents uh, and people that are leaders driving enterprise results is they're very good early stage and understanding who are these influencers. They ask that second set question and they get to those people that are positive influencers, but that what they're really, really good at is they're also saying, well, who might be pulling in a different direction, right? And, and you have to figure out how to phrase it, right? So you're not irritating anybody, but they're finding the negative influencers that way. And by negative influencers, a lot of times people think of curmudgeons and you might have those, right? We all do, right, in different ways. But it can be just people that are slightly different incentives, right? That are going to kind of be pulling against a cultural initiative that you're trying to, uh, to shift. And that was um, across a lot of our work, one of my biggest surprises is the really successful leaders were good at getting the negative influencers early, getting them engaged early rather than trying to win by mandate later. Um, and it had a, had a really dramatic impact there. We'll uh, we'll circle back to to positive and negative culture carrier folks in, in a little bit, but first I, I know on your next slide you have sort of different categories or different types of of key opinion leader key key influencers. Um, tell us a little bit about those. Yeah, yeah. So when I think of influencers, you know, the the knee jerk reaction a lot of times is to think about who are the people that I'll call central connectors, right? And central connectors for me as a term are people that just know a lot of other people, right? They're they're strictly kind of defined by the number of connections they have. Usually they tend to be heavily popular in a given area. So let's say in finance, in marketing or in a geography, you know what I mean, like London or whatever it may be. Um, so they tend to have heavy local influence in terms of affecting other people in the organization. But we're always interested in them because if you get them engaged early or you're cascading your communications through them, you get a much greater uptake, right? Or impact, right? Of, of diffusion of what you're trying to accomplish. But what we know is their influence is local, right? They affect right. finance, but they may not affect operations per se, right? And so you really care about them as a, a source of uh, influence and a, and a certain way of leveraging them in a change process. It's more about kind of diffusion. But then the other thing I love about these people, this is a, one of the major uh, uh, aeronautical organizations. I was with their top 120 one time and, and we were going through these ideas and, and they, they kind of came back and they said, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. Because now I, if I know who these central connectors are, I know how to who to tell what to think, basically, <laughs> right? So it was all, it was completely a, a, a one-way flow of information. Mm -hmm. And what we're learning is actually, if you can get these central connectors to talk about what they're excited about in their work, and you actually think about how do we reverse this a little bit, um, you get much greater, again, uptake of what's going on in different ways, just telling their stories, right? What are they excited about? What's happening in this change that they're kind of resonating with? So they can be super helpful right, on, on a diffusion and then also kind of an emergence of culture uh, idea on that level, depending on how you're, you're tapping into them. The second category, they're defined for me 
Um, and I guess this is getting into the details a little bit that, that I love and maybe five other people on this call will love, but, but the rest of you are going like, why does he care about this? Um, but but there, there are people that I would call boundary spanners, right? Or Malcolm Gladwell's book, if you read The Tipping Point, they're kind of the people that are the reason that things like at that point in time, HIV diffused through society or, or you know, drug sharing or things like that. They're these people that sit at the intersection of groups and they really matter to me because they, they make things move across groups well, right? And so boundary spanners for me, they're defined not by having a lot of connections in a given area, a capability, a geography, but because they're knitting uh, groups together. They have connections across groups. These people I love for different reasons, right? We know if we get these people engaged in our design or implementation teams early, they have a sense of what's gonna work in each pocket and they have credibility in each pocket. And so they can be proposing ideas that get much greater uptake and they can be reaching into their network to get you know, much greater uh, uptake as well. So kind of care about and leverage them uniquely from a, a cultural change process. Uh, and then the third category of people that I really care about are what I'll call energizers, right? And so this is an idea I've been mapping for 26 years, 400 organizations, a lot of other people, you know, people on this call have been using this idea as well. Um, but it's this basic notion of you interact with some people and you walk away just a little bit more enthused uh, about what you're up to, right? And, and so it's not an abstract idea of, you know, uh, energy from a cosmic standpoint or things like that. It's just that some people create engagement and followership, right? And we know that if you can find them, and especially if they happen to be central connectors too, sometimes these people go together, then you have the head and the heart of the organization and the uptake is dramatically different, right? And, and we'll get into this a little bit more, you know, as we go in terms of what energizers do, but it's it's not just charisma or at all. We're as likely to see a very low key be an, a person be an energizer as, as somebody that is traditionally charismatic. It's very behavioral and it's things that you can influence and have a, uh, a pretty significant impact on, on how you're uh, taking things up. So we care about these people a lot and from a change standpoint, and if you think about it way too often, we allow culture to be defined as do the leaders walk the talk, right? That's mm -hmm. what we measure so much. And it's all about the leaders and are we kind of mimicking their behaviors of the leaders communicating down. A huge proportion of what creates culture in organizations is our interactions with our peers, right? That's how it's transmitted. That's how we observe what we, what we see, what we think, what we need to do differently. These ideas help us to get to that. It helps us to see who are the people that are going to have disproportionate influence, not just saying the leaders have to do it, but we actually want to you know, see this a little bit more tactically in terms of what's happening there. So say a little bit more about that, the contrast between these very important influ informal influencers, if you will, who, you know, the sort of the real cultural leaders, they may also in some cases be leaders in terms of the org chart, but very often they're not. So right. contrast that. I know. I know. On the next slide, you've got you've got some points that contrast that when, with with the sort of traditional leaders, if you will. Right. So this will go a little bit more deep, you know, into to, to the analytics. But I want to keep it at a principal level too, so so people are kind of tracking. Uh, you want to use both levers, right? In any kind of change effort, whether it's culture or whether it's you know a formal restructuring, whatever it may be. Clearly, um, uh, decision making authority, resources, sometimes information that exists by virtue of formal structure, right? And you need to have that kind of engagement. Um, what we're talking about here is a different form of influence, right? Those people that heavily sway, you know, what others care about. And what we can see when we run the network analytics, this is a live example. I've just pulled out one very small unit from a much bigger ONA that we did. Um, but in here you have the leaders are in blue. And if you actually quantify this and, and, and measure kind of how many people they're touching, they turn out to touch 53% of the population. I don't expect people to, you know, just trust me <laughs> on this. We have analytics to, to go in there. Um, if we then take, okay, what are our equivalent three influencers, the people that are most connected, turns out that they reach 78% right, of the population. And they actually reach a different group than the, right. the leaders do. And that's a really important thing that we see. So if I kind of convert all this into a sideways bar chart that we have on the right here, and we look at this 1100 person organization, what we generally find is that the leaders, if we're cascading, they're really good at getting the top two layers, right? Just like that example I mentioned earlier, they buy into it because they've all been in the offsite together. 
all ready to go. And they, they kind of cascade a little bit of it. Um, but what gets missed is the deeper level down, right? And that's where, if you track with me, the oranges are the, where the leaders are pinning coverage, right? The blues are where the opinion leaders are. Um, are I'm sorry, the other way around. No, the oranges reverse, are where the yeah. opinion leaders, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody's behind this little screen on me here. Um, but you get the idea, right? Is that it's the deeper levels down that the opinion leaders really matter, right? And and yeah, so both that, that's critical because if you reasons. just... if if you saw the 78% versus the 53%, you'd say, well, we should put a lot of energy uh, into the cultural influencers. And yes, maybe maybe that's what's being missed often and it is a higher percentage, but this the the chart there on the right really shows the distinct, uh, you know, who other than mid-level managers where both groups are pretty close, uh, they're, you know, like you said, you really need to focus on both, uh, right. both groups uh, and not, not, not just the traditional leaders at the top of the org chart, which most organizations already do, um, but, but, you know, both groups. Right. And you might be, again, leveraging them differently, you know, in terms of how you are saying, gosh, we're going to use a certain set of interactions to design what we care about from a culture standpoint. We're actually not going to make it just the proxy of the leaders. They need to be there, but others. And then a certain set of people that we might really be interested in the diffusion part of it, right? And how do we cascade things, you know, differently in, in ways that, that have impact there. Um, what we see in general with the challenge is number one, as I've already mentioned, leaders are inaccurate as to who they who these influencers are. You know, I can say in general, um, they're about 50% off. Not in not in small groups like this, but when the groups, you know, get beyond 30, 50 people, if I ask them to guess ahead of time, now here's the trick if you're gonna go do this at home, don't ever come back in to your leader and say, here's your opinion leaders. Um, because they'll look at it and say, well, of course, what you always do is say, tell me who you think the top 10 are first. <laughs> and, and then you kind of show them, you know, the list of whoever. And that's when you kind of get their attention because they're going to be off. They'll get the top two or three right, but they'll miss four or five, eight, you know, et cetera. And it just starts to get their attention. But it's a much better way to, to kind of get them engaged in the ideas than if you just give them the list and, and say, here's, uh, here's who you want to be. But there are a lot of inaccuracies, right? And so these ideas tend to be, whether you do it from an analytic standpoint, uh, or you do it from a um, uh, more of an intuitive standpoint, like I was talking about second order questioning, um, it's important. And number two is there, there's, as I mentioned here, it's just different impact, right? Each of these people you want engaged, but you just want them to be used and tapped differently uh, to, to kind of diffuse, uh, diffuse the ideas. So let me pause there, Tom, and see are there any, any questions or if people yeah, have there, any questions, thank you. you know? Yeah, there, there are a couple of questions. One, just a quick clarification question. Marlo asks, how do you define reach? You, you're you talking about reach of, of these people in these networks. Um, Marlo says, how do you define that? Is it with heart and head or just in your own words, how would you define reach? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. So reach for me being the, you know, the, the typical academic, that's a very mathematical term <laughs> in terms of, you know, we can use graph theory to see like who are the people that are uh, getting to the most others, right? And I don't want to go into the nuance of this because, you know, being an academic, we can, uh, you know, beat that to death. But for me, it, it means, um, you know, the, the people that are directly impacting the most other people, right, in the network. So that's their kind of reach. Now, we can spin this up even further to say, well, it's not just direct impact. It's the fact that that I know Tom and Tom's a great opinion leader um, uh, actually has an impact on Zeta, right? As an example, and you can see this is true in different places, but it gets very complex when you start measuring the, the second and third order uh, connection. So for me, I'm focused mainly on what are the direct uh, uh, connections that these people have and how much of the network are they covering, if that makes sense um, there. Great. And then a question from Christopher is coming at coming at this work, uh, this body of work from sort of a DEI and, and mm. belonging lens, maybe. How have you used this process to examine potential biases that impact career development of women, people of color, et cetera? I mean, yeah. we, we know that, uh, unfortunately, women and people of color are still, you know, very lowly represented in the highest levels of leadership. Um, but to the extent that they may be more evenly represented as cultural influencers, those three groups we saw on the previous slide, um, maybe you know focusing more on on that level than than organizations sort of naturally do might have a, a positive impact from a DEIB uh, lens. But yeah, but I, what are I your thoughts could, here? Could not agree more. And it's it's one of the things I'm most I've been really passionate about. So for as an academic, you know, for 
26 years I've been at this and I would tell companies, can you give me information on, on, you know, these differences, right. Of people. And basically I was allowed to get gender for years and, but anything else, nobody would let me see. <laughs> it took me a while to figure out that there was, you know, potential legalities involved and things like that as an academic, because I kept thinking about this is what enables us to start to see true inclusion, right. And are we actually having uh, impact in different ways? And, and, you know, with the uh, George Floyd, murder, right? That kind of shifted people and they started giving um, me ethnicity, some other elements like that. And it's really fascinating. So what, what we've been able to see in the, in the select cases that people have been willing to share and then talk about how do we uh, drive these changes is the way you want to create influence for people is locally in their networks. And so you say, well, what does that mean? Um, by that, I mean, we could actually see that, that a lot of times people in minority categories that had formal mentoring relationships so this very positive thing that's very common in, in DEI efforts, um, they actually ended up leaving the organizations earlier, <laughs> more rapidly, right? Um, and, and there's a couple of different possibilities that, that you can explain for it. The, the programs that really worked, what was happening, we could see is they were really good at helping people build more robust local networks. And usually what we saw is if you could take a transition when somebody was either moving into the organization or moving across projects, and then we would create five, three nudges for those people that, that, and their people leader, right? And said, okay, there's five kinds of connections that matter early. Um, you need to create pull versus push for your ideas. And I, I'm happy to delve into that if it's helpful to people. But very specific things, we were finding that that had a huge effect in getting inclusion, more so than the formal mentoring relationships or things like that um, today. And, and that people were being pulled in more naturally, that trust was being developed more rapidly at a, at a local level. So I'm hugely bullish about the possibilities of, you know, some of these ideas and being more targeted and, and what's, you know, what's going on there to create inclusion. Uh, and also to the point that was made about, do you understand who your influencers are, right? Are you leveraging, you know, different, different influencers? Interesting. There? That, that gives, that gives us another tool in the, in the DEIB uh, toolkit, if you will. Um, that people probably weren't aware of or hadn't thought of. So um, that's great. We had one other question in the chat from Emily, um, which uh, I think is sort of as a nice segue. Uh, she's asking, what are your thoughts on the amount of time to be spent on swaying negative influencers versus those <laughs> that sort of sit on the fence? Is it beneficial to pull resources around those closer to being a change champion as opposed to those that are outright negative influencers? And I knew we were gonna pivot to the sort of a little bit more insights on positive and negative culture carriers next anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, and I, I guess the thing that I'll say is one of the more interesting things we found is um, when we run these analytics and if we combine a network analysis with maybe a traditional survey, right. And, and is asking, for example, do we value transparency, right. Or should we value it? Or, you know, what are our, our priorities or goals um, As you do tend to find in general, one of the unique things of O and A is the people that are most negative on some dimension, some trajectory, and the people that are most positive tend to be dead center in the network, right? And so you get this weird situation where, you know, you have positive change agents that are kind of trying to drive things ahead. And then you've got this equally influential set of negative influencers that are creating a stasis, right? With their sets of connections. You can't see that through conventional metrics, right? The conventional surveys, you know, you get these average scores of four, you see the variance in it, but you don't know who's kind of influential. As a, as a matter of direction, what we found, you know, for Emily's question, and I'll go into the, the specifics here, is if we can use this to understand who are the positive uh, change agents and how do we get them telling their stories. Remember I said that earlier, like get their stories up and, and communicated through different vehicles um, and they tend to kind of have a positive impact. Then what we found with the negative is, is some of the most impactful things. And there's different categories of negative, so I don't want to overdo this, um, but, you know, it's giving them voice. And, and putting them in charge of certain things, right? So they're not complaining about it, they're doing something about it. And it is really worth doing, right? And not, not to cater to them um, and, and kind of say, how do we you know, make this all work for you? But to create you know, voice in the process, to create accountability, right? For doing something about it. Um, it does have a pretty you know, significant uh, impact there. When, when I look at this from a, a network standpoint, and again, I'm going to delve down into the, the weeds a little bit and people can kind of go there with me or not, um, but just kind of hold on to the idea that, that these values 
right? If you kind of say, well, what do you care about in this organization? They're not equally distributed, right? Or if you ask, what are your priorities in your work? Like a lot of times we'll do this in merger situations and see what are the core priorities uh, in our work? And you'll find that, you know, people, you, you, some set of people may prioritize things that are getting efficiency. Some set of people prioritize things around innovation. Some set of people prioritize things around customer excellence. And so you actually end up with these groups that are pulling themselves apart, right? Just pursuing different objectives in their work. And this can be a great way of, uh, of being able to see that. So a lot of times we will marry the uh, network analysis with uh, assessments that are saying, you know, what are your priorities? And then we can start to understand, do we have different opinion leaders that are problematic for the change effort? And I'm, I put up three categories here. There's kind of the antagonistic and that set of people are where you have these rifts in networks. And it's really because they're incented differently, right? Or they care about different you know, aspects of the work or they believe in different bodies of science. They are kind of legitimately in conflict, right? Around this change that you're trying to, uh, to, to, to bring into play. So you really care about seeing that because it's, it's gonna happen. It's gonna slow the change process down. And if you can see that as gosh, it's not everybody, it's four or five pockets that we need to kind of find ways to, to bring people together. Um, you know, that's a, 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 an important thing. Uh, indifferent is more typically where there's integration possibilities, but people just haven't seen it, right? They're, they're not really understanding how does my work fit with this new, you know, way of working and with others. And there's different interventions that you, you kind of, uh, you know, hone in on there. What we find really helpful with this is uh, with the antagonistic subnetworks, you know, if you can find ways to create forums that appeal to higher principles and say, you know, how should we be working together, um, then you can in, in pretty quick order get people that have been fighting with each other to agree, right? It, it almost always happens, right? When they back away and they say, well, you know, really, here's, here's what we should be doing. Example of this, to, to speak less abstractly, um, I'm not going to mention the name of the company, it was one of the world's uh, leading software organizations. And this was a group that they were struggling to get to provide security, you know, in their, in their web-based platforms that was composed of three different groups that did very deep things. These three groups, for some reason, had learned that they were absolutely supposed to hate each other. <laughs> they had no idea why anymore. It was some rift that had happened like 20 years ago, probably. And as people had come in, they just knew that they weren't supposed to trust the other group, right? And, you know, we, they, pulled them into the room. The leader focused on some of these ideas around how do we really, you know, say if we work together, here's how we would integrate, right? And they put them at tables and got people talking. A day or two later, all this kind of stuff was disappearing. It didn't go away entirely, but it was a product of being able to see where is that friction point happening, you know, and, and how do we kind of address that rather than, than let it persist. Um, in different networks, um, usually by that, I mean, they again, they just haven't seen the reason they should be working together, right, in certain ways. And there's different activities we focus on there where people are posing challenges uh, and it starts to help them see different different uh, ways of, of working together. And then the latent networks are typically sources of resistance that are likely to emerge. Don't really focus on them as much. It's usually the first two categories that we can uh, kind of see and and take very, very targeted action on. So I know this is a little bit in the weeds, but the core idea is, again, if you took the network analytics and you also measured, you know, what are the key priorities we have for this organization? You start to see that people are pulling themselves apart, right? In ways that these analytics kind of let you go in and target, you know, different, different kinds of things. Um, the other point that, that you mentioned with Emily was, you know, what about the, the, the negative influencers? And I'll go back to this idea of when we map these networks around energy um, and see kind of who are the positive people that create enthusiasm and passion. Um, we know that, that when I map networks over time and we look to see where is culture change taking hold, it's almost always through these energized connections. Right. And again, I go back to this idea that way too often we say leaders have to be the ones communicating culture change. What we find is these energizers, you know, if you get them engaged, you're much more likely to see people change their opinion as a product of kind of engaging with the uh, with the energizers. So that's um, a strong kind of on the positive side. I will say on the negative, I'll just give you one example. You know, there is we've had a lot of opportunities where we would go out uh, like one major life science organization, let me map 6,500 people. And he came to me at the start of this. And again, I'm being super careful to not <laughs> disclose who these people are, but he said, Rob, I have a culture of fear. 
here. And, mm -hmm. you know, you hear that and you're like, oh, good luck with that. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, like, what do you, you know, how do you, how do you do that? And he had the courage in this case to let me map fear, right, in this group. And, and it wasn't like, am I scared of Emerson or Zeta or whomever, right? Physically, it was, do I hold back in their presence, right? And these were super smart people, probably some of the most brilliant scientists and what they did commercially in the world. And yet you found they were terrified of each other, right? You know, you looked at 6,500 people and it was this massive web of people that were saying that I just don't test new ideas, right? In front of others until they're completely bulletproof because I'm used to getting shot down by, by experts. So you, you look at that conventionally and you're like a culture of fear. Wow, good. You know, that's a tough one to, to do something about. When we use the network analytics, what we could see is it was of 6,500 people. It was a small set of um, experts, like about 65 or so that, that weren't using their expertise well. They tried to constantly show how smart they were, right? And they affected a lot of other people because they were so central. Small set of leaders that didn't quite know how to lead in an engaging way. And, and they needed to be kind of shown how to create inclusion in the meetings and, and things. And then for me, one of the most telling one was a small set of scared people. So they weren't creating the fear, but they saw it everywhere and they told everybody else. <laughs> and so they're just as bad, you know, in, in their own right. So, you know, again, you're not using these ideas to go pinpoint people and say, Tom, why are you like this? But you can back away and say, you know what, if we got 65 people to just use their expertise a little bit differently, another 65 to lead a little bit differently, and then the 75 to stop telling everybody how bad it is, it was huge effect, right, in, in terms of the way that that culture held. So for me, and I think, again, to, if I understand Emily's point, it's not to cater to the negatives, but it's also not to ignore them and just try to pile drive over them because there are different ways of, of, of finding ways to, uh, to remove the negative resistance that I think has a, has a pretty big impact there. Uh, but let me pause and see any, any quick questions there, Tom, or you yeah, tell no, me I, I think, I think we're good there. Um, fascinating. The, the sort of nuances, like you said, um, just getting people to lead a little differently, getting people to, um, you know, be sh share their expertise a little differently can, can make a big, make a big difference. Um, I know we wanted to cover too some, some, uh, give people some very practical practices. Yeah. Um, you've, you've talked about the energizers, uh, in yeah. organizations. Uh, why don't we pivot to that? Yeah. So, um, and, and so this is again, work that I've been focused on for 26 years. I started this work in uh, one of the major blue chip professional services firms. And we found out that leaders that were energizers were four times as likely to be high performers as, you know, others. And it is work that has consistently borne out in showing very successful leaders, successful teams. Uh, if you see successful change happening, usually it's in the context where there's energy created uh, in the interaction. So uh, myself and, and people on my team for years and years and years have gone behind these network analytics to see what are the energizers doing, right? What is it that they're actually doing? Because you're, again, it's not conventional ideas. It's not just people are cheerleading. Uh, it's right. not extroversion. You know, it's very tactical and behavioral. And what we found is there tend to be uh, four things they do that, that create a foundation of trust. Uh, we know that energy is never built if trust doesn't exist in the relationship. Right? If, if you can be as charismatic as you want, people may fall for what you say one time, but if you don't come through on that, the next time around, they're going to be questioning, right? And they won't call you on it, but they'll distance themselves. So there are different elements of trust that we know matter, and, and it always matters to, to kind of do you create energy. And then it's created in the moment, right? Do see people see realistic possibilities? Uh, do they use humor and typically self-deprecating humor well to, to take mm -hmm. tension out of the room? So what we thought we'd do here is just ask people to play along. And, and uh, if you can, we're going to do a quick poll here as it will pop out. And I'd love for people just to indicate, you know, if you could isolate, you know, one or two things that uh, could be important to you in your day-to-day -day work or important to leaders uh, in your organization, uh, I'd love for you to just pick, you know, one or two of these and see um, uh, what, what, what people say here. So we'll pause for about 30 seconds here to, to yeah, let thank, do that. thanks, Rob. This should be a multiple response. Uh, so go through which ones jump out at you for either your work or maybe leaders in your organization. Um, just, just trying to see which ones jump out to folks here on the call as sort of norms that maybe you could make greater use of uh, with, with those energizers or to create more energizers in the organization. Votes are, are coming in. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. We'll give folks another 20 seconds or so to respond. And uh, I'll get Rob to give his thoughts on which one's got the most votes.
All right, we'll give folks another 10 seconds. Votes are still coming in. Just pick the one or two that are jumping out at you as maybe being the most powerful. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share out the results. So Rob, it looks like follow through on commitments mm -hmm. got the most uh, got the most attention, followed by, uh, I guess, create room for others to be meaningful part of conversations. Yeah, yeah. So I'll and I'll. Uh, I'll grab a couple of these, and we've obviously built tools that that members have access to. This is a real easy thing, even just these nine behaviors to put in front of a group, right? Put down in front of your team and say, gosh, these things matter. What do we want to hold ourselves accountable for, right? It just puts a little upward pressure on everybody if they've been showing up in a way that's criticizing an idea early. It's not that the... Um, the uh, energizers don't disagree, right? But they tend to do it very differently than the de-energizers. Mm -hmm. They tend to come in and say, rather than come in and say, that's a bad idea, right? For these reasons. And they would, you wouldn't may not say it that directly, but you would be from that lens saying, gosh, here's why we can't do this thing. Um, the energizers might come in and say, gosh, given where we're trying to go, here's an alternative, right? So they're right. Um, both um, um, kind of separating the critique from the person and they're exposing their, their own thinking. Right in the in the process of of doing that, so um, you know, it's a great thing to put down in front of a group, and then it's a great thing in your one on ones with people to kind of pull it up and say, well, which one? When you're under stress or pressure, not do you do these things or not? Because we do them generally. The real issue is when we're under stress or pressure, which do we let slip? Um, and then you know, hone in on that. And so I will say, like, I'll grab the create room for others to be a meaningful part of conversations. That's a team based thing, right? And mm -hmm. finding forums that you are drawing people in. And if you have more introverts, you're more thoughtful about how do we make, go around the room, give people time to collect their thoughts, the things you're doing that make sure that, that people are part of the conversation. Busy leaders struggle with this because they oftentimes come into situations, they've got five things to solve and they sometimes are better off leaving it at three and, and kind of getting engagement, right? A lot of times they might leave that meeting, think, gosh, I solved all five. They feel energized, but they've left a lack of energy, you know, if not worse, right in their in their trail, and they don't they don't tend to get the engagement. I'll tell you another way that's a huge leverage point, um, and we built a, a very simple tool on this that everybody can grab, is how leaders are managing their one on ones. Right? And we find that the when I did this work, the high energy leaders they ran their one on ones fundamentally differently mm -hmm. than the low energy ones, so they were more likely to be about fifty percent of the time off task. There was a specific set of things they were doing in the one-on-one -on -one that actually created voice, created influence, um, created energy, right, in that interaction. Uh, and so that's certainly, you know, another you know, very, very tactical thing that that leaders can employ here. I mean, it's a very practical list. Uh, I'm sure people will will grab this from the recording or, or from the from the slides. Uh, and thank you for connecting it to both how leaders, you know, conduct their one-on-ones and just the broader sort of performance management process as well, you know, getting people to focus on maybe one or two of these that, like you said, during a moment of stress, you know, we all do these, like you said, at, at times, some more than others. Um, but, uh, but at moments of stress, maybe are there one or two that you could work on in the upcoming quarters uh, in yourself? Rob, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, I, I want to hit, I, because I shared a data point earlier on the, the role that yeah. trust plays in culture. Um, I think you've got a few insights to share on trust and, and then we'll wrap from there. Yeah. So let me, um, this is um, uh, part of a, the team study we did. And I think, again, there, there's so many intersecting linkages with this work. I think the more you can drive effective teaming into teams, the more that creates the culture right, of collaboration or things that we were talking about around transparency. But with that work, and, and this is against things I've been doing for 20 years, is mapping different forms of trust uh, in, in groups, right? And so for me, when I think about trust and, and trust researchers in general, it's not my idea, um, they tend to think about it in terms of benevolence-based trust. That's trust that, you know, Tom, you at least have my interests in mind, right? And, and, and I can trust you at, at that level. This is the closest equivalent to what many people think about with psychological safety, right? Is that you can kind of voice, you know, opinion. But there are two others that really matter. One is competence-based trust, and that's trust that uh, you have the capability to influence the course that I'm on, right? And, and that I'm willing to kind of listen to you. And we're not really good at that. You know, it, a lot of times we know what we can do. <laughs> and so we just say, well, here's an, here's an idea. 
Um, but we don't present it in a way that gives other people that are new to us enough information to trust us quickly. Right? And so what I would find is, you know, they're, they're high trust people rather than come into a situation and say, here's what we can go do. They're much more likely to say, here's what I've done before. How could it apply? That simple pivot suddenly makes, you know, Tom's not looking at Rob saying, well, do I trust Rob? I don't know. He's hair talons. I don't like the way he looks, whatever it is. Um, and, and kind of saying, well, he's already done it here. And, and how does it apply? So there's simple little tactical things that, that has a lot to do with whether people trust in somebody's competence. In general, though, uh, many people aren't good at sharing their expertise in a way that helps other people have enough information to trust you. So it's not, are you trustworthy? It's, have you shared enough that creates that competence-based trust? And then the third turns out to be dependability. And that basic idea from, a, from trust research, it's more about integrity. It's more about what we think about with leaders when we say, do they walk the talk? What I was hearing in a lot of this work is that's important, but also just this basic idea of, can I trust that Zeta is going to do what she said she's going to do? Right. And am I going to go ahead and commit to a course of action and put a lot of effort in and, and then find out, you know, that and Zeta, I'm not picking on you, obviously, but find out that, you know, uh, one or two people don't come through. And it actually turns out that the dependability based uh, dimension of trust was the most critical, right, of all these three things uh, statistically uh, in predicting, you know, greater success. And I think that's a big deal, right, to be thinking about trust from a culture standpoint in a more nuanced way. A lot of times we just say, do we trust blank broadly? And usually that equates to benevolence. But I bet many people have been in this, you know, on meetings where you're sitting there and you think I've got a really good idea, but I don't know if I trust Susan to come through. I don't know if I trust Sammy to do this, right? And you kind of hold the idea back. It's no different than, than psychological safety, right? You're still holding the idea back. You do it for different reasons, but it's still having the same deadening effect on innovation as a product of that. Uh, the key to me is that each of these forms of trust are built differently, right? If it's benevolence you're worried about or a, a culture of fear like that leader I mentioned, there are very different things you do to help people connect off task, to help you know, them engage. If it's dependability, you're putting structure into work differently, you're setting you know, accountability norms. Uh, and so I think that's an important thing, right? To really be thinking about from a culture standpoint, not just this blanket appealing concept of trust, but what are we trying to, to build in? And we know that it really matters, right, for virtual work. And this is uh, work we've been doing for some time where we're looking to see, you know, what are the interactions that people are saying they need to have with their colleagues that either need to be in person or, or synchronous, right? And then what can kind of drift, you know, into the, the um, virtual realms or asynchronous realms. And basically it, it boils down to interactions that create energy and purpose and trust, you know, uh, interactions that create development opportunities and interactions that, that create innovation. The interesting thing with this is you have to ask yourself with your leaders as they are adopting new kind of return to office strategies. Typically it's not the five day a week thing we're seeing a lot about now. Are they using that time differently? Right? Are they bringing people back and, and using that time in a way that builds energy and purpose, development, and serendipity, or are they running through their project plans, right, and, and more conventional ways? And I think that suddenly becomes very actionable, right, from a, from a culture standpoint as you go. Uh, yeah, so with that, I will that say, from, you know, thank you, Tom, for Yeah, you know, yeah, we've seen this. that from multiple studies, being very intentional about how you return people to the office, how you use those office days differently. Um, so thank you for the, the added insights there. Rob, this has been great. Always love having you. We try to get you here every three or four months on, on Next Practices Weekly. So appreciate everything that you shared today. Okay. Thank you. And thank you to everybody. <laughs> Um, I want to remind folks, we have a new study that we've just released called the Future Ready Culture. Um, the brief for that is available uh, out on our website. So you can scan the QR code there and go to the or go to the link. Zeta has put that in the chat. We'll also have a, a webinar coming up on November 19th. So mark your calendar. We'll have our CEO, Kevin Oaks and our VP of Advisory Services, Marshall Bergman. Some of you have seen Marshall uh, with me on, on Next Practices Weekly at times. Uh, they'll be doing a webinar on this new study, The Future Ready Culture, very related to, to what we discussed today coming up in November. And lastly, for those of you that have uh, a certification with either HRCI or SHRM, every week, every session of Next Practices Weekly is available for your recertification credit hours. Just jot down the number from the chat uh, or here on screen, and you'll be all set there. With that, thanks again, Rob. Thanks, Zeta. Uh, and everyone, have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye now.